Hello and welcome to the Woodburn Seventh Adventist Church YouTube channel. We are happy that you have decided to join us for our adult Sabbath school lesson study. Welcome. We are at the start of a new year, 2023, and therefore we have a new quarter. And the topic of the quarter for the first three months of the year is managing for the master till he comes. My name is Jade Frey. I am the Sabbath School Superintendent here at Woodburn and we're happy that you have decided to join us for our review, our input, our opinions, our, our take on the adult Sabbath School lesson that is published by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We here at Woodburn are happy and we're inviting you to stay with us for the entire quarter, even for the entire year, as we present our adult Sabbath school lesson study. Before we go any further, I invite you to pray with me. Almighty God and our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your guidance and your protection. Thank you for a new year, a new quarter, and a new opportunity to share the good news of your salvation with people all around the world. I ask that you continue to bless our efforts. Give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding now as we open your words. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right, so we are looking at, for this quarter, again, managing for the master till he comes. We are at the second week of January of the first quarter, new quarter. And this week's lesson is entitled, God's covenants with us. So we are therefore taking another look on the concept of covenants. Now the word covenant is not a word that we use in our day-to-day -day, um, lives. It's not a common word these days, but it's certainly very pronounced um, in the Bible. Um, it is not something that we readily can relate to. The best word that we use to describe a covenant is really a contract or, or an agreement. However, those words, they don't fully express what God is trying to do through the use of his covenant. But I hope that as we explore this week's lesson, we'll get a better understanding of what a covenant is and what its intention is or what God's intention is for using covenant in our experience with us. Let's look at the memory text first of all. It is Deuteronomy 28 verses 1 and 2 and it says, Now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Here is an example of a covenant. Here this is saying, Moses is saying here to the people, to the Israelites, that if they diligently obey the voice of the Lord, God will do something for them. God will bless them. He will set them high above all the nations of the earth if they only just obey the voice of the Lord. So this is an example of a covenant, of a covenant. This is an example of God saying to his people, this is what I have in store for you. This is what I have to give to you. This is my promise. This is my part of the agreement, but it comes with a condition. And that condition is that you obey my words, that you keep my commandments, that you diligently, as how Moses puts it, obey the voice of the Lord. Now the lesson wants us to understand that there are different types of covenants. The first one that it looks at briefly is what it calls unilateral covenant. We can also call these covenants universal covenants as well because it doesn't require uh, a response from the second party. It, all covenants involve multiple parties it could be one it could be two or more so all covenants involve multiple parties but the unilateral covenants are the universal covenants 
doesn't require a response from the from a second party it is basically a declaration that one party will be doing something no matter what the other party does some some examples of these highlighted in the lesson is in mark 5 verse 45 where it says here he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust also in genesis 9 verse 96 following the flood the lord declares that every beast of the earth they will never a flood will not overcome the entire earth once more and also there will remain seed time and harvest cold and heat winter and summer all day and night shall not cease that is genesis 8 verse 22 these are all universal or unilateral covenant that does not require a response from the recipient no one has to accept the offer it is universal it goes for the good um the just and the unjust the good and the evil the rich and the poor everyone it's a universal as the name suggests however the focus of our study for this week are covenants that require a response from the people from us from one party so it is god who is who has designed was created these covenants and he has laid it before us as human beings for us to accept they are not universal the benefits that are contained therein is dependent on whether or not we accept the conditions so sunday's lesson it's entitled the salvation covenant the salvation covenant right so the lesson here wants us to understand that christ's death on the cross makes it possible for every single person to be saved Christ's death on the cross makes it possible that each and every one has the possibility to be saved. There is enough room in heaven for every single one that has ever been born, that are alive now, and that will ever be born. There is enough room in heaven for each and every one of us. There is a room there for you, and there is room for me. There is space. Heaven is not too small right so you don't have to be concerned about you know does god have space for everybody does god have a space for me yes god does have a space for you and he is offering you an opportunity to claim that space no one can claim it but you and so i would just like to appeal to you if you have not secured your ticket if you have not secured your title of that space in heaven that you do not hesitate to do so right now and claim that space because Christ's death, John 3 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, anybody, believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God doesn't want any of us to perish. He doesn't want anyone to be lost. He doesn't want you to be lost. He doesn't want me to be lost. It's for us to accept. The offer that he has made it is not universal there's something that we have to do he has opened the door it is for us to enter therein the door will not be open forever one of the one of these days the door will be closed because sin suffering destruction and the cruelty that we see happening around about us it cannot go on forever god being the loving god that he is he cannot sit and allow corruption and sin and murder and cruelty to be perpetual to perpetuate um, endlessly he will be put in in his appearance and he will be taking those who have accepted this offer to live with him um, forever in the world made new right so this is the salvation covenant that exists and we just look at some text here that helps us to understand further about the conditions there in 1st John 5 verse 13 and reads these things have I written unto you that be that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe in the name of the Son of Man 
so we can have eternal life if we but believe in the son of man believe in jesus matthew 10 verse 22 says and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake but ye that endured to the end shall be saved so we are called to accept salvation we are called to walk through the door that god has opened so that we can have everlasting life we are called to endure to the end we may face opposition we may face hatred we may face resistance but we are called to endure to the end so that we may have everlasting life so this is what sunday's lesson would like for us to understand and paul understood the bilateral nature of the of salvation very clearly and he declared to timothy he said to timothy for i am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand so paul knew that his death was close but he was contented he said he is now ready he said i have fought a good fight right he said i have finished my course i have kept the faith henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day and not to me only but unto all them also that love is appearing here we see where all is confident that he has been faithful to god he says i have kept the faith it is this is that faith that he knows he will be saved by not because he have done in a good work or because you have done any great things but only the faith that we have that he has kept that faith in christ jesus so that crown of righteousness that he's talking about is the righteousness of jesus because paul himself says that his righteousness is as filthy rags so therefore he was not referring to his own righteousness but the righteousness of jesus and he that righteousness cannot be tarnished that righteousness is already secured so we do not have to worry about the sins that easily beset us we have to claim the righteousness of christ we are called to keep god's commandment yes but we cannot be saved by keeping the commandments we keep the commandments because of the love that god has demonstrated towards us and we reciprocate that love by keeping his commandments right so paul clearly understood this he clearly is confident that his reward is waiting for him on the resurrection day all right we move over to monday's lesson monday's lesson is entitled to hearten diligently now what does it mean to hearten diligently i think that means that we are to make a deliberate effort to learn what is god's will for my life each and every one of us we have to search the scriptures we have to pray we have to study god's words we have to commune and connect with god and do listen to the voice of the holy spirit and ask what is your will for my life god what do you want me to do for you how do you want me to serve you we have to diligently deliberately seek to find those answers for ourselves and once we have done that we again have to be deliberate in our efforts to follow through on those plans that god has laid out for us and we have to be faithful to him as we do this and this requires us to submit our lives submit our will to god submit our lives to the will of god and even submit our very will to the will of god we should not no longer seek our own pleasure we should seek what is it that god wants us to do so that is what i think it means to to hearten diligently it means that we should make the effort we should put effort and time into finding out what does god want me to do for him and we should be faithful to that instruction when once we know what god wants us to do we should go forth and do it without hesitation and submit our lives to god it is interesting that although it might sound like a lot to um submit your life to god and to not seek your own pleasure it might seem um very complex but when you stop to think about it 
God is not asking us to do something that is too hard. This commandment which he commands for you is not too mysterious, nor is it too far far off. It is not in on, on, on the moon or on a, a, the top of a mountain or on Mars or on Jupiter where we have to ascend you know, out of this world to get it. The commandments of God are very simple. He has laid out 10 simple commands for us to follow in very simple language. Thou shall not kill, thou shall not steal. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Thou shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. Those are just a sample. The language is so simple. If you should um, open any book about the constitution of any country and read the laws that men has outlined, they are so complicated. Yeah, you one would have to go and study at a at a university, um, and study this thing day and night to come to a fulsome understanding of of what the law is trying to um, promote or promulgate or what it is trying to realize. But it's the God's laws, God's commandments, they are very simple, right? Very easy to understand. They are within our reach, so it is not something um out of this world that god has called us to do we are called to submit our will to submit our lives to god and keep his commandments god could have called us to go on some long journey so to travel to walk many miles and to crawl on our knees and to walk walk through thorns and thistles and all these things but he has made the way to salvation very simple and straightforward in, in my opinion it could have been uh, more complex than it is but the commandments of god are very um simple so we are called to hearken as 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 how tuesday's lessons as our monday's lessons would um put it to hearken diligently um to, to god so that we can know what is his will for our lives and then submit our lives to his will Tuesday's lesson calls us to honor the Lord. Tuesday's lesson for me reminds us of what we would have studied last week when we looked at the fact that we're all part of God's family. Last week's lesson establishes the fact that God is the owner of all things and we are called to honor God. Let us look at what Proverbs 3 verse 1 to 10 says to us. Proverbs 3 verse 1 to 10 reminds us that my son do not forget my teaching but keep my commands in your heart for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity let love and faithfulness never leave you bind them around your neck write them on the tablet of your heart then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of god and man trust in the lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight do not be wise in your own eyes fear the lord and shun evil this will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones honor the lord with your wealth with the first fruits of your crops then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine there is definitely a promise here this is definitely conditional there is something for us to do and god is basically saying here if you do this then this will be the result if you honor the lord with your wealth if with the first fruits of your crops then god will fill your barns to overflowing and your vats that's sound like some sort of storage will brim and overflow with new wine so the principle is still, still exists today we are all called to acknowledge God's ownership over all things right nothing though should spur us on more in trust in God and his love than does the cross when you realize that each one of us has been given in Jesus not as our creator not just as our creator but our sustainer and also our redeemer returning to God the first fruits of whatever we have is indeed the least we could do this should be easy for us to return our first fruits. What does it mean? What's the concept though of this first fruit? For me, the first fruits means that we should give priority. We should give preeminence 
we should give the first part the most important part it should not be a afterthought no matter what you're giving if you are giving of your of your time god had said that we should keep his sabbath holy and god's instructions should take priority on his sabbath day we shouldn't allow our own personal affairs to encroach on the lord's sabbath now because you have something to do it is not more important than what god has asked for us to do when it comes to giving of our treasure it should not be an afterthought we should not think to spend all of our salary and on our bills and food and clothes and whatever exp other expenses we have and then wonder what can i give or what what is what remains but it should be first the first item on our budget so when you are doing our monthly budget or returning being faithful and honor god in the, with our tithe and offering should be the very first line item on our budget because it is we should treat it with a level of preeminence and importance so when we are giving of our time when we are giving of our talents when, when we shouldn't um treat god business as if it is secondary or not as important as our personal affairs the same level of effort the same level of commitment the same level of creativity and enthusiasm that we use to execute our 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 work during the week we we get to work on time we we are tired according to the the dress code that that our, our work we you know if they say that we should dress this way for work we we comply god has asked us to come into his presence um holy so we have to comply with with what god has asked us to do we get to work on time we put out effort into meeting our targets um for our workplace it's the same energy it's the same effort it's the same vigor it's the same um professionalism um, and quality that we should put into when we are doing god's work because he is indeed worthy so when we are using our talents for the lord we should do it to the best of our ability we should get priority preeminence it is should be the first fruit we shouldn't serve god tiredly right we should serve god with preeminence and and energy right so god says here if we put him first our barns will be filled with plenty right so here it says that it, we see where the the conditional aspect of this um covenant and this promise outlined here in the book of proverbs all right we jump over into wednesday's lesson which is looking at the tithe contract remember we're looking at some of the covenants that are laid out in the bible and we're looking at the fact that there is one that is a tithe contract and we'll turn to malachi 3 verse 7 to 11. malachi 3 verse 7 to 11 here says ever since ever since the time of your ancestors you have turned away from my decrees and i've not kept them return to me and i will return to you said the lord the question is asked but who ask but you ask how are we to return then god responds with a mere mortal rob god yet you rob me this is very strong word that the malachi uses here the word rob is a very strong word it is probably more it's probably worse than to steal something because usually when you steal something the person who you are stealing from is unaware but when you're robbing somebody it is usually a very brazen um act you usually it's usually a, a hold up the person is is seen and the person is well aware and it is indeed is indeed the case because god knows all things so we are bare faced in when, when we um refuse to return our tithe and offering it is robbing god is very bare faced but you ask how are we robbing you um, verse 8 god responds in tithe and offering you are under a curse your whole nation because you are robbing me verse 10 says bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house test me in this said the lord almighty see if i will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it i will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields and not drop their fruits before it is ripe said the lord 
Almighty. So although the, the although Malachi here uses such strong words to say you are robbing God and that you are under a curse, the whole nation immediately the tone of the text shifts to where God is saying, Bring all the tithe into sorrows, right? And you will open the floodgates. It's not a it's not a sprinkle, it's not a drip. Right, it's not even a, a downpour, it's floodgates of heaven. That is how much God wants to bless you if we are just faithful in the in our tithe and offering. You just imagine the, the text the, the Malachi could have said you could throw out, you know, you could um pour out, you know, a sprinkling of water or pour out a downpour, but it's just floodgates. So God wants to abundantly bless us from heaven and here we see also where God is inviting us to put him to the test the text says test me right Malachi 3 verse 10 says test me in this God is inviting us to test him in this right God is inviting us to be faithful with our tithe and offering and he will bless us abundantly God promised the people that if they would return to him he will return to them so it is really a return as the text suggests because everything is god's god owns the earth is the lord's and the fullness thereof there is nothing that we can create in and of ourselves anything that man makes it is something that we take what god has already created and turn it into something else so everything is already god so god is just basically saying return you're not saying give it to me or or pay me or, or transfer it to me is return because it is God's in the first place. Even the things that we use our our imagination to come up with, it is God who has blessed us with that level of creativity. God has blessed us with wisdom. God has blessed us with our talents. God has given us all our skills and our abilities that we can use to generate income. So it is already God's. So he's just saying, return to me. And if you look at it, he says it's the same things that you return to me, you will multiply it and return it unto us even more. The floodgates of heaven will be poured out. And these are good gifts. These are not earthly gifts that, that temporary is gifts from heaven. So they are certainly um, worth it. So we move on now to Thursday's lesson. Thursday's lesson is the highlight for this week. Thursday's lesson is entitled Seek Ye First. The text Thursday's lesson refers to Matthew 6, verse 25 to 33. This is Jesus talking here. Jesus says, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? I like that line. I like verse 27. Verse 27 asks us a very pertinent question. It's a rhetorical question. It says, can any of us add an hour to our lives by worrying? Can worrying change any situation? No matter what situation you are going through, no matter what devastating news you are expecting to come your way or what negative results and outcome you are expecting in life, worrying doesn't change that, right? So worrying cannot add a single hour to our life. Verse 28 picks up the words of Jesus. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things. That verse 32, verse 32 says that for the pagans run after these things. We as God's people, we cannot be following the pagans, right? The pagans run after these things. Allow them to run after these things, right? Christ is saying, your heavenly father knows what we need. We need not worry about clothes or 
where are where you live or what you're going to eat those are things for the pagans to worry about and the pagans to chase after those material things christ is inviting us to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness that should be priority in our lives that should be preeminence that should be our main concern that should be the first line item in our to-do list to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness i know what happens after that after you have demonstrated to god that you are seeking his righteousness seeking his kingdom first then all those other material things will be added unto you so i implore you that you seek ye first the righteousness of christ seek ye first the kingdom seek ye first salvation secure your salvation what shall it profit a man if he shall lose his own soul and gain the whole world so we are all called to seek first salvation let us look at some other texts which help us to understand the concept of seek ye first isaiah 26 verse 3 Isaiah 26 verse 3 says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusted in thee. So if you are perplexed, if you are stressed, if you are worried, keep your mind, trust in God, and he will do it. He will give you perfect peace. Not 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 not, not, a, not a empty peace. It's perfect peace. Do you want perfect peace today? All you have to do is to trust in thee. Trust in God. And he will give us perfect peace. Let us look at First John 1 verse 19. First John 1 verse 19 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. All we have to do is to confess our sin unto God and he will certainly um, forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then Second Corinthians 7 verse 14, another um covenant it says if my people the beef if they are suggest that it is conditional if my people if you who are called by my name god is calling you by his name right god is claiming you as his you are my people if you will just humble yourselves and pray and see god's face and turn from your wicked ways then you will hear from heaven and forgive our sins and heal your land god wants to heal us god wants to forgive our sins all we have to do is humble ourselves and seek him all these verses and many others deal with the important fact that although god is sovereign he is our creator and sustainer and although salvation is a gift of grace and unmerited on our part we still have a part to play in the great controversy drama here on earth using the sacred gift of free will free choice we must do and choose to follow the prompting of the holy spirit and obey what God has called us to do. Though God offers us blessings and life, we can choose cursing and death instead. No wonder God says, therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. So there I have it laid out before you. God has invited us to choose life. He has opened the door for us to walk in. This is your choice. The choice is yours. Walk in. Choose God. And he will welcome you into eternity. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening to our adult Sabbath school Bible study. See you again, same time, same place next week.